Hello and welcome to Tech Day 2015, uh, session titled Optimizing Your Simulation Experience. My name is Brandon Adkins, Application Engineer with Quest Integration, and I'll be leading you through the discussion topics for optimizing the simulation experience. On the agenda for today, I have several items that we're going to cover to give you guys some ideas about how to incorporate multiple analysis types to help answer questions about your engineering design uh, while incorporating multiple software capabilities from SOLIDWORKS simulation, flow simulation, as well as SOLIDWORKS plastics. The ideas that uh, we're going to talk about will help you to handle multi-physics analyses and situations where you may have multiple analysis types to incorporate. Once we're finished with our multi-physics analysis, we're going to talk about some common issues and experiences with a few of these software capabilities. Based on our support calls, um, some of the more popular topics have to do with SOLIDWORKS simulation. So based on the popularity of those topics, we're going to cover some common uh, troubleshooting ideas when it comes to SOLIDWORKS simulation. As many of you know, when it uh, when engineering designs are ready for prototyping, there's a couple of different routes that we can go. We can either prototype virtually, which may include software such as SOLIDWORKS simulation, flow simulation, or plastics, or we can go the route of physical prototyping, where we may actually build the prototype and go out and test it in a physical environment. Either one of these scenarios is going to require investment both um, from time and a, a financial perspective. So we have to think about our resources. Do I have the software tools that I need to perform these analyses? Or do I have the equipment that I need maybe to manufacture a physical prototype and go out and test it? Either one of those scenarios, we have to think about what is the investment that we're going to make before we build that prototype. So just a couple of ideas really to think about before you start building your tool belt for virtual or physical prototype analysis. For the example that we're going to look at today, you can see in the top right hand corner we have a radial controlled um, quadcopter design that our team has come up with here at Quest. What we need to analyze before we move forward with production on this is are some of these new components going to be strong enough to do the job that we've designed them for. So we're going to be performing structural testing on a few of the components for those arms where we're going to mount the motors and the propellers. We're also going to analyze for manufacturability and this is where SOLIDWORKS plastics will come in to help us answer questions about the plastic parts that we've designed. Are they going to be easy enough to manufacture for what we've designed them for? Before we jump in and actually begin running some of these design validations, I want to talk about the different products within the SOLIDWORKS product line to help you guys get a better understanding of what tools you may have already in your tool belt. If you need to perform a static analysis on your assembly, then SOLIDWORKS Premium is the tool for you. If you do get into any kinematic analysis or event-based motion, SOLIDWORKS Premium does also have those tools available. The next step above that is SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional. If you need to analyze your structure for frequency, buckling, fatigue, optimization, thermal, drop testing, or pressure vessel relative to ASME pressure vessel codes, Simulation Professional is the tool that you would use for that. The next step above that is SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium. If you need to analyze nonlinear materials, composite materials like carbon fiber, or if you get into any advanced dynamic situations, things like seismic testing, you would use the simulation premium package to perform those analyses. Those are all of the finite element analysis packages um, within the SOLIDWORKS product line. In addition to that, we also have the SOLIDWORKS flow simulation computational fluid dynamics package, which will handle a variety of different scenarios for internal and external fluid flow. So we'll take a look at some examples with our quadcopter design using flow simulation. And we also have multiple levels of the SOLIDWORKS plastics package. This is designed to help engineers and manufacturers 
answer questions about manufacturability of the plastic parts that they've designed. Uh, and there's multiple levels, like I said, two SOLIDWORKS plastics to help us gain insight to things like warpage of material due to cooling, uh, fill time associated with manufacturing, some of those important questions that you may need to answer about your plastic parts. Now when we get into our analysis here today, um, we've talked a little bit already about multi-physics scenarios. And really what that means is if we have simulations that incorporate multiple physical phenomena or multiple uh, different scenario types, that is a multi-physics situation. So when we think about it, this in terms of the tools that we have in SOLIDWORKS, for the analysis that I have for you today, we're going to take a look at flow simulation for a couple of different reasons. One, to analyze heat transfer, and two, to analyze forces in motion. For example, the rotating blades and the air moving around our quadcopter design. We're going to use flow simulation to gain some insight to the behavior of our structure. We're also going to take advantage of the static analysis available in SOLIDWORKS Premium uh, to help us apply forces due to the air moving around our structure. We're going to incorporate the heat transfer results from flow simulation. And this will give us really a better understanding of how that device is going to perform under these multiple different load case scenarios. Once we've done that, we're going to incorporate analysis for our manufacturing processes. Some of the components that we've designed here today are going to be manufactured using plastic injection molding processes. So SOLIDWORKS Plastics comes in handy here to help me figure out if these parts are going to be easy enough to manufacture. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at the example that I'm going to walk through here with you guys today. So let's begin with our assembly. You can see that we've got several of these components already put together. My carbon fiber arm, you can see there's the plastic cover on the underside of that arm. Inside that plastic cover, we also have an electronic speed control unit. This is an electronic component that will emit some amount of heat as the quadcopter is operating. So that may need to be an important part of our analysis process. We'll have our rotating propeller. We have the motor mounted here. These are all components that will contribute to my structural analysis in some way, shape, or form. So beginning with the overall assembly, let's take a look at what we have set up so far. If any of you get into analysis um, of fluid flow with rotating components, the first step that you're going to need to take is to model a rotating region. Flow simulation requires you to use a simplified rotating region model to incorporate things like spinning blades, for example, this propeller. So we've just modeled um, a region around that rotating blade. Now when we get into the analysis portion, we're going to specify that rotating region. You can see here that we've specified our rotating body from the rotation part that I took a look at in the analysis tree. And we've just assigned an angular velocity uh, to it. In this case, we're going to spin that rotating region at 10,000 RPM in the clockwise direction. In addition to that rotating region, we've also incorporated an initial condition for the air around our arm structure. So we're going to say that worst case scenario, we'll be moving in the Y direction with this structure at 15 meters per second. That'll be the hardest turn that this copter is designed for. So those components together will contribute to the forces incurred in the material in this carbon fiber arm and the plastic material uh, for the cover. When we get into the structural analysis, you'll see how we just how we incorporate the forces due to that rotating region and so forth uh, when we get into analyzing some of these part bodies. We've also specified some goals in this analysis. And this is important for flow simulation because if we think about it, really we, we should know ahead of time what we want out of this analysis. I already know that I want to gather information about forces applied to this carbon fiber material. So I've set some goals here to monitor pressure and forces on the blade material here in my assembly design. 
this will not only help me to gather the information I need very quickly, but it's also going to help the solver converge the study and make sure that I get accurate results in a reasonable amount of time. Now that we've set up our study, specified our goals, we can start taking a look at the results. So for example, if I need to investigate pressure distribution across the faces of those blades, I can see the minimum and maximum variation of pressure across those different faces on the model. So this is a visual representation, something that I can use to gather information very quickly. I can also map items like flow trajectories. So if I need to track particles through that rotating region or moving fluid, we have the ability to do that with flow trajectory studies in uh, SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. Most importantly for this analysis, we're going to take a look at surface parameters. And this is what will allow me to gather numerical data about information like force components on the faces of those blades. So you can see I've specified all of the same faces that I used to set up my goals, and we're going to monitor the force components on those faces. Very simple to do, and we can get in and take a look at our minimum, maximum values in the X, Y, and Z uh, directions. In this case, our Y direction is the main contributor to the force on those blades, and the value of force is right at about 3 newtons. Now, for the analysis that we're going to perform in the finite element analysis tool, we're going to be using that value as a reference. So the only thing I need to remember at this point is that value in the Y direction is about 3 newtons. When we get into the structural analysis, we'll use a safety factor. I'm actually going to double the force that we've used uh, or that we've gathered from the results of this flow simulation study. Let's go ahead and take a look next at some of the parts associated with the structural analysis. To keep things simple, I've removed some of the geometry that's not necessary for me to analyze at this point. The motor and the propeller are items that I'm not concerned about stress distribution in those components. So that's why we've moved to simplify this analysis and bring it down to the part level in this case. Where we're going to begin with this actually is in flow simulation once again. We're going to analyze heat transfer due to the operation of that electronic speed control unit that's inside this plastic cover. So what we've done in this case is we've assigned materials for all these components, the carbon fiber materials as well as uh, the plastic material for that cover. And we've also assigned a heat generation rate here in SOLIDWORKS flow simulation. During operation, that electronic speed control unit will emit about one watt of heat. We've also specified goals here that will help us monitor the temperature of individual components as well as the surrounding fluid. So all that's left to do is go ahead and load up this, those results and we can get a closer look at the temperature distribution relative to that operating electronic speed control unit. So visually we can inspect the results here and gather information about temperature distribution. In this particular case our delta T is relatively low we don't have a lot of temperature change throughout the material, but it may be a contributor uh, to the structural effects of that plastic. As we know, if we heat up a plastic material, it's going to have some effects at some point on the structural uh, capabilities of that material. So what we've done next is begun the finite element analysis portion of this multi-physics scenario. So we're going to move over to SOLIDWORKS simulation now. We've set up a static analysis. We've applied a fixture where this arm would be mounted to the rest of the quadcopter. You can see that we've applied a force where the motor would be mounted to and where we would have a force being applied due to the rotation of those blades. We've simplified it a bit in this case and said that we're just using a 6 Newton force in the upward direction. We've also applied the thermal effects from the results of our flow simulation study. 
And just to show you how easy this is, all we have to do is modify the properties of our SOLIDWORKS simulation study to incorporate flow and thermal effects. So if I have temperature distribution from flow simulation, I can browse to my result file there to incorporate those thermal effects. I can also incorporate items like fluid pressure uh, from flow simulation. So we've taken account for um, a lot of those different multi-physics scenarios already with this analysis. And when we get into the results for the structural test, you can see that the uh, stress results within our materials are relatively low in this case. Not a whole lot of uh, stress buildup in our materials. Not a lot of displacement occurring. You can see that the values are pretty low, less than one millimeter of actual displacement in the model. So we're able to begin moving forward with this design. Stresses are relatively low, even if we were to double some of those forces in our worst case scenario for operation. We may also be concerned about friction forces or contact force between some of these components. Anytime I'm interested in taking a look at some of these individual components, for example, this plastic clip that holds the plastic cover to the carbon fiber, if I need to take a closer look at the forces on those faces of contact, uh, for example, if I'm concerned about the components maybe sliding around or moving apart or something like that, I can take those measurements of free body forces to help me investigate where those faces of contact occur. Do I have excessive force in any direction that may cause a free body motion? In this case, the values of force at that location are relatively low. So we can assume that these parts are going to be safe. They're not going to come apart during operation of our assembly. So we've answered some good questions already um, in terms of moving forward with our, our virtual prototype and getting closer to a physical prototype um, by taking some of these steps already in SOLIDWORKS simulation and flow simulation. The next step that we're going to take with this is going to help us to answer some questions about manufacturability of these parts. In this particular case, we're going to analyze the only plastic component in this multi-body part design. So you can see here that we've eliminated some of the other bodies in this part, and we've singled it out just to the plastic component. And we're going to use SOLIDWORKS plastics to help us define the analysis um, for this plastic part. So the way we've set this one up, you can see that we have our material injection location for the ABS material on one end of the part. We can modify different parameters like material usage, different injection molding machines that we may want to use if you have different runner systems or hot runners, um, different items like that that you may use for plastic parts. Those are all things that you can set up as part of your analysis. When we get into the results, depending on which package you're using of SOLIDWORKS plastics, you can incorporate results for warpage if you need to verify that the parts are not going to warp excessively when the material cools. You can use the warp package for that. In this case, we can see deformation is relatively low, less than half a millimeter once the part has cooled. We can also take a closer look at what it's going to take to manufacture the part. So if I'm interested in fill time for the mold cavity, I can gather some information about total time associated. I can even see the characteristics of the material flow throughout the mold cavity. And you may be able to see some areas where you may need to change some things about the design. You can see, for example, these vent locations are relatively slow to fill, so that may be a challenge when it comes to manufacturing. And indeed, if we take a look at our ease of fill plot here in SOLIDWORKS Plastics, we can see that some of these areas where the material is very thin may be difficult to fill. It gives me some nice, easy to read feedback um, right here in SOLIDWORKS Plastics. I can also investigate items like weld lines where I'm gonna have flow front coming together. I may have structural issues where those weld lines have occurred. I may have issues to deal with in terms of air traps. I don't want to damage the molds because they can be very expensive. 
So this will give me a better idea of where I may need to add air vents to the mold to prevent damage to the mold in the future. So that really gives us quite a bit of information, not only from the um, engineering perspective of this new design that we've come up with, but also from the manufacturing perspective. Are we going to be able to make these parts easily enough um, to proceed with our release to market? So now that I've taken a look at some different applications for these software packages, I want to delve in and look at some of the common issues and experiences with the SOLIDWORKS simulation package. As I mentioned, this is where a majority of the popular questions come up is within the finite element analysis package, SOLIDWORKS simulation. So we'll talk about a few tips that you can use to help you get your analyses done efficiently. Many of those topics would include meshing, contact definition, simplification of your models, and also solver type uh, definition as well as some of the options that go along with that. So let's start first with some meshing tips. For those of you that may be new to SOLIDWORKS simulation, a little bit of background about the mesh types that are used in simulation. Beginning from the top here, um, SOLIDWORKS has solid mesh available. This is a three-dimensional tetrahedral type mesh which typically fits best with bulky objects where you've got a lot of material to analyze uh, solid parts. These are best analyzed with the three-dimensional uh, tetrahedral or solid mesh. For parts like sheet metal, very thin parts that you may need to analyze, we have a two-dimensional element type called a shell, which is a triangular shape element. This is best suited for thin parts, really to help you gain um, an advantage from a computational standpoint to help the analysis solve a little bit faster. Same theory applies to the beam or truss elements, which are another 2D element. These are designed to help us uh, take advantage of resources on our computer, help to analyze these different studies that we've set up efficiently and get results quickly. The beam and truss elements are typically suited for long extruded parts with a constant co cross section. You'll see here in a little bit that these 2D elements are represented as a very simplified shape. So beginning from the left hand side here, this slide you can use if you'd like to pause the video at some point. You can use this as a quick test for yourself to help identify different uh, element shapes. On the left hand side we have our shell mesh. These are the triangular elements that we talked about. And there's multiple different types for the 2D triangular elements. If we add more nodes to those triangular elements, this is called increasing the order or increasing the order of the polynomial shape of the triangular shape that we've represented. The default draft quality triangular element only has three nodes associated to it. If I increase the order of the polynomial that represents the edge of those triangular shapes, I'm adding more nodes along the edge locations, which is going to ultimately help me increase the accuracy of my study because then I, I can account for more accurate deformation of my parts the more nodes that I have in my calculation. Moving along to the middle section, we can see our tetrahedral shapes. On the left hand side here is a draft quality tetrahedron, so we only have four nodes associated to the corners of that tetrahedral shape. If we increase the order of the polynomial associated to the edges of that tetrahedron, we can incorporate better accuracy for deformation within our parts that we're analyzing. So these are our tetrahedral shapes here in the middle. And as you may have guessed, the third element type here is the beam element. Very simple 2D element, again representative of long structural member type shapes with a constant cross section. This is representative of your neutral axis of those beam or truss type shapes. So when you get into analysis, which mesh type really is designed to work best for you? Well, it is possible if you choose to perform an analysis with a single type of mesh. If you wanted to choose all solid elements to run your analysis, that's perfectly acceptable. 
Um, but there are some pros and cons to doing it that way. The upside to using a single mesh type is it's very easy to deal with contact. If you have multiple mesh types in use in your study, you're going to have to make special considerations for contact between those different element types. For example, a beam element that's in contact with a solid element, you may have to incorporate a manual definition of contact between those components. If I were to incorporate multiple types of mesh elements in my study, this is going to really help me to decrease calculation time very quickly. But on the negative side, it may be a little bit more difficult to deal with contact between components of different types. Like I already mentioned, um, mesh elements that have different types in use, you may have to account for with local contacts, which we'll talk about later on for best accuracy and best practice of use in SOLIDWORKS simulation. In addition to the different mesh types that we've talked about, if you get into a situation where you need to troubleshoot your mesh or items in your study are not meshing correctly, there are a couple of other options that you can use with your global contact, and these are called compatible versus incompatible meshing. A compatible mesh is enabled by default when you begin a study in SOLIDWORKS simulation. This is where you ha would have maybe multiple parts or bodies in your study. Everywhere that those bodies contact, you're going to have a direct overlay of the nodes in between those different parts. So you can see here that my two parts in contact for the top image have direct correlation between their node locations. This is best for accuracy of results, especially if I'm concerned about the contact between those components. It's best to use a compatible mesh. However, in some scenarios, it may be difficult to mesh parts. Uh, for example, if they're very different in size, uh, if I have a large structure with maybe some small fasteners incorporated. Sometimes it can be difficult to mesh those with a compatible mesh. So an incompatible mesh is something that you have available to you. This is not going to follow the requirement of using a node overlay. Each part can have nodes in completely different locations. This may help to eliminate uh, some of the time associated with creating the mesh for your parts. However, you may have some concerns when it comes to dealing with stress concentrations in those parts. Uh, with an incompatible mesh, you may see some unexpected results in some locations. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, you may have some areas in the model where you may not be able to trust the results uh, as much as if you were to use a compatible mesh but it is something that you can use to help speed up the analysis. Another item of concern when we get into um, talking about the results or even the performance of our finite element analysis has to do with refining our mesh. We all know that the element size will definitely have an effect on the accuracy of our results. So some items to consider um, up front when we start setting up the analysis are things like feature detail. If I have very small features like fillets or chamfers, maybe some small holes for mounting locations that don't contribute significantly to the stiffness of my structure, those may be items that you could eliminate from the analysis to help simplify and run the analysis more efficiently. Some of the techniques that you can use to refine the mesh once you have the geometry laid out the, one, the way that you like it, you can take advantage of global refinement, which is just changing the size of your mesh for all parts in the analysis. Or you can use local refinement to specify different areas within the model where you may want to change the element size. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that local refinement. You can either do it manually or automatically. So I'll talk about some of those options. A manual definition of mesh refinement is typically going to be applied to things like faces of the models, where you're going to choose a different size of mesh element to apply in that region of the model. This is a best practice to use if you're going to analyze the results, if you have a specific area of concern within the design where you need to analyze those, those results with accuracy um, in greater detail, it's best to apply those manual refinements because that allows you to gather information where you need it in an efficient manner. The automatic options will let the solver calculate the results 
and then apply successive loops of mesh refinement based on the material strain energy. So wherever there's um, material strain energy that's a significant difference between the last iteration loop, it's going to apply a mesh refinement in those locations. So we'll talk about some of the different automated um, options for adaptive meshing. You have two options in SOLIDWORKS simulation for adaptive automatic meshing. You have the H adaptive mesh it, meshing, which will uh, decrease the local mesh size in certain areas based on the material strain energy. And you also have the P adaptive, which is going to increase the order of the elements in certain areas based on the material strain energy. These two methods are currently supported for solid parts and assemblies in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of how these do uh, adaptive mesh element types work. On the top section of this slide, you can see the H adaptive method. If I apply forces to this bracket structure, wherever I have material strain that's greatest, um, between the different successive loops of mesh refinement, it's going to analyze the percentage difference in material strain energy. And you can see that in some areas where I have high stress concentrations, it's going to decrease the element size in those areas to help increase the accuracy where those stress concentrations occur. The second option, the P-adaptive mesh, is going to change the polynomial shape of the individual elements that have been created. And it'll do this in successive loops to help me add more nodes to the analysis automatically. More nodes is going to help increase the accuracy of the study, but we're not changing the element type. So it can be beneficial uh, really to help us keep the size of the analysis manageable pretty easily. And these are two techniques that you could absolutely use individually or you can use them in combination with each other uh, really to help gain accuracy in the results. Some other areas that come up in dealing with troubleshooting items in SOLIDWORKS simulation have to do with contact definition. If you've dealt with simulation for any length of time, you've probably run across some error messages like what you see on screen here, where it tells you that the model may be unstable, you may not have uh, adequate restraints, or maybe there's an excessive displacement that occurred. Many times, if we're dealing with an assembly analysis, this has to do with the way that contact has been defined between components. If something hasn't been accounted for correctly, we may have some inadequate restraints in the model. So some items that you need to think about, how many parts do I have in contact uh, relative to the overall size of the assembly? Maybe it's beneficial to eliminate some items from the analysis and simplify it a bit uh, to help avoid some of these errors. You may also need to think about the types of mesh that you're using. If you have mixed mesh types and you see one of these error messages about in inadequate restraints, you may have to make special considerations to bond those elements together or create a no penetration condition between them. Some different methods that you can use to actually create the contact definition between those components. You can do this globally, you can do it on a per component basis, or you can use individual contact sets. And I'll talk about each of these methods individually. The global contact definition, for example, if I wanted to bond all of the parts together in my analysis and treat them as uh, welded together. This is an analysis definition that you can use only for touching faces in the model. So for everything that is completely coincident, that global contact condition is going to apply to those parts. For anything that does not fit that criteria, you're going to have to account for those gaps in between the different components by applying local contact or uh, component contact between those. You could also use a global contact and account for gap specifications. So if they do have a modeled gap in between components, typically you can use a global contact and just specify a gap condition to account for uh, all components in the analysis. Another portion of this that's important is to recognize the hierarchy for how these contact definitions are applied. In the software, the global contact definition will be applied first. That's our top level component contact. 
any other component contacts, if I have part one and part two, which are treated as maybe a bonded condition or a no penetration condition, those will be applied and will actually override whatever is specified at the top level. And then at the highest of that hierarchy is a local condition. So if I have two faces on the models that can't penetrate each other, I would apply that local no penetration condition and this will override any of the settings for these lower two levels of that hierarchy. So just a few items to think about when you're looking at contact definition. These items may be important to help you troubleshoot your analysis. Some other tips that I use to help define contact, you can look at interference detection in your SOLIDWORKS assembly. This will be used to help you identify areas where the model is coincident, has coincident faces, or maybe interference to deal with before you get into the analysis. Uh, it's a useful tool to help you figure out where those contacts need to be applied. If you're using SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional 2014 and above, you also can take advantage of the contact visualization plot. This will show you in your simulation study where component contact has been defined, where local contact has been defined to help you figure out if there's anything missing from the analysis. You can use some of these methods that I just described to help you troubleshoot your analysis. If it comes to an issue where your study may not run or you may have insufficient restraints, you can use these in combination with suppression of components. So you can start removing components from the analysis to begin figuring out which one is causing you an issue when you're running your analysis. In terms of the geometry itself, we know that we need an adequate mesh to capture our model detail, but too much detail may leave you waiting for quite a long time when it comes to calculating results. So take advantage of tools like geometry analysis in the tools menu. This will help you figure out if you have very small features in the model. You can then suppress those features if you like, or you can take advantage of the simplify tool, which will allow you to automatically suppress uh, individual small features in the model to help simplify it a bit so you're not spent um, waiting for the analysis to run because of too much detail. The last couple of topics that we'll talk about here have to do with solver type definition. There's a few solver types uh, in SOLIDWORKS simulation. You can choose the iterative FFE plus, you can choose the direct sparse solver, the Intel Direct Sparse Solver, or the Large Problem Direct Sparse Solver. So I'll talk about each one of these and what they're best suited for. The Iterative Solver is best suited for large mesh problems where I have a very large number of elements, but I have a very simple contact condition. So just a global bonded contact or something very simple like that. The Iterative Solver is best suited for those types of analyses. If you have a lot of local contact definition, it's not recommended to use the iterative solver. If you do have a lot of local contact definition, it's best to use the direct sparse solver. Uh, the calculation solver type for the direct sparse um, solver is suited well for uh, local contact definition and dissimilar material types. Keep in mind, though, that it can be more uh, time-consuming for larger mesh problems. So that brings us to the next solver type, the large problem direct sparse solver, where we get the best of both worlds. We can handle larger mesh problems, but we can also take advantage of the specific capabilities of the direct sparse solver, like incorporating dissimilar materials and large numbers of local contact. The last solver type was introduced in SOLIDWORKS 2015, the Intel Direct Sparse Solver. Uh, this is available for the static, thermal, frequency, linear dynamic, and nonlinear studies. And it was designed to help leverage um, memory allocation for multi-core and in-core uh, capabilities, really to help improve solution speed. So just some different items that you can take advantage of. Choose your solver type. Most of the time, the automatic option is going to be a pretty good way to go. You may run into some scenarios where choosing the solver type manually is going to help you to actually run the study um, a bit more efficiently, where you, know, you may run into errors or problems with the study. 
it's a good idea to try choosing the solver type on your own. Now that you know some of the criteria and some of the things to look for with those different solver types, you can do that ahead of time rather than allowing the software to go through and do it automatically for you. You'll always know which solver type to use. So we've covered a lot of those common issues and experiences. Hopefully you were able to gather uh, some new troubleshooting tips to help you through your SolidWorks simulation analyses. Um, hopefully you were able to gather some ideas earlier on today about multi-physics analysis. If you do have any questions about anything topic related to this web session today, feel free to give us a call at the number listed on screen or you can send any questions to support at qintegration.com. We'd be glad to help you out. Thanks again for watching and I hope you enjoyed Tech Day 2015.